This is the second episode of Mechanically Speaking, an entire video on shooting in first person. So what makes the FPS so addictive? The answer is something called flow. Flow was named by Mihai Cheek Sent Mihai in 1975 to describe a specific mental state, one we're all familiar with even though we might not be familiar with the name. Call it being in the zone. It's the act of being completely absorbed in whatever one is doing, a state of motivated focus, spontaneous joy, and a loss of reflective self-consciousness. This is a huge opportunity for game designers, and since first-person games are intrinsically immersive, that opportunity is bigger here than anywhere else. But what about first-person games that aren't shooters? Games like The Witness, or exploration games like Dear Esther. Can they use flow the same as first-person shooters? Well, I don't think so. And the reason is that first-person shooters tick three checkboxes, three thresholds to attaining flow, in a very specific way. The first threshold is rhythm. This is Space Invaders, the first shooter ever made. Its gameplay hinges on one simple fact. The rate of fire is just slow enough to force the player into cover every few shots. And there's a sort of dance to it, and that's what I mean by rhythm. Game designers can use rhythm to combat habituation. Habituation is a learning process characterized by a decrease in response after repeated exposure. And it happens every day. We learn to tune out repetitive noises or ignore a strange sense over time. But if habituation happens in a video game, the player falls out of flow. Jamie Griesmer said that Halo was designed to be 30 seconds of fun over and over again. What he meant by that is that Halo's mechanics were tweaked so that the game state would never stay the same for longer than half a minute at a time. He refers to these 30 second chunks as combat cycles. A single combat cycle can't last for too long. If it does, habituation takes the player out of flow. Halo accomplishes this in the obvious ways. Weapons run out of ammo, players need to scavenge for new ones, vehicles break down, and shields fail, forcing players to retreat. But it doesn't shy away from using hidden math or subtle design choices either. Halo 2, for example, hid the player's health to emphasize the need for cover anytime shields were down. And in Halo 3, the longer the player was out of cover, the more accurate her enemies became. The most common way to pace combat cycles is by forcing the player to reload. GoldenEye popularized the reload mechanic in 1997. Since then, it's been present in almost every first-person shooter. It's a hallmark of the genre. In the hands of a master designer, it can be the keystone to establishing rhythm. We can use clip size, rate of fire, and reload time to dictate when each combat cycle will start and end. The actual numbers depend on the kind of game you want to make. The variables in Call of Duty, for instance, are dramatically different than those in Metro 2033. Let's talk about balance, or more specifically, the balance between the player's perceived skill and perceived challenge. In 1987, Cheek Sent Mihai helped publish what is now known as the Experience Fluctuation Model. The top right corner, where perceived skill and perceived challenge are both higher than average, is where flow is most likely to occur. Game designers need to do whatever they can to help the player reach that upper rightmost section. But it's important to mention that perceived challenge isn't the same as actual challenge. Let's look back at jumping. In that video we said it's important to make 2D platformers easier in subtle ways with ghost jumps and lenient hitboxes. What we're really doing here is raising the game's perceived challenge higher than its actual challenge. By doing that, we keep the player's perceived skill higher than his actual skill. And by doing both, we keep the player in the top right corner of the fluctuation model, and closer to being in flow. And sometimes, we need to do the same thing with first-person shooters. In Doom, the perceived challenge is to shoot the bad guys. But back in 1993, the game was designed with keyboard aiming in mind, which was an incredibly inaccurate way of controlling a weapon. So the actual challenge grew from this, to this. And the same thing happened in 1996 to Duke Nukem 3D, and on consoles, it was even worse for Goldeneye. Late 1994 saw the release of Marathon, and Quake in 1996. Mouse Look had become the standard on PC, and the disparity between actual and perceived challenge evaporated. 
That didn't happen for console shooters. As the genre matured, we started to notice the discrepancy between actual and perceived challenge more and more, and that discrepancy caused perceived skill to plummet. 2000's Alien Resurrection was the first game that had dual analog controls by default, but it wasn't until Halo that the control scheme hit the mainstream. Halo's success was largely due to the way Bungie used aim assist to increase the player's perceived skill level. Bungie's designers used four different kinds of aim assist to make the second control stick feel as accurate as a mouse. Acceleration, friction, snapping, and bullet magnetism. Acceleration causes the camera to move faster when it's moving towards an enemy. Friction causes the camera to slow as it moves over its target. Snapping reorients the camera towards an enemy anytime a player's reticle is in proximity. Bullet magnetism causes bullets to bend towards the intended mark. You can see this with a charged plasma pistol, or how the first shot of an assault rifle will always hit even if only a small section of the enemy's hitbox is in the reticle. It sounds complicated, but unlike earlier systems, Halos has the potential to keep the perceived challenge and skill high enough so that the player doesn't drop out of flow. As a player's perceived skill grows in tune with a game's challenge, they begin to feel more and more competent. The more competent they feel, the more they want to feel competent. This theoretical cycle is called competence motivation, and it is the key motivating factor in shooter games. But you do need one more thing for competence motivation to happen and for the player to attain a flow state. You need clear, unambiguous, and immediate feedback. What happens when your bullets hit their targets? Let's take a look at Destiny, Left 4 Dead 2, and Fear. Notice how the enemy animations overact the impact of the bullets. Jamie Griesmer calls this exaggerated causality. It's what I'm talking about when I say clear, unambiguous, and immediate feedback. Griesmer also uses what he calls the YouTube test to tell whether or not a hit animation displays enough feedback. Does the animation still communicate enough if it's played in the tiny YouTube video player? If it does, then it's probably good to go. This is one of the key reasons why gunplay can feel weak. Here's Duke Nukem Forever. The enemy animations don't sell the impact of the bullet, so we have a hard time telling whether or not our shots hit. The hit marker is sometimes a necessity so games can display feedback at long ranges or from behind walls, or online where the enemy's location on your screen might not match his location on the server. But what happens when shots miss? Fear does a great job of exaggerating misses as well as hits. And don't let exaggerated causality stop at visuals. Sounds can sometimes provide even more immediate feedback than visuals. What happens when we get hit? Or when we get close to death? Can you hear me? The Battlefield series does a great job of giving the player feedback through sound. You can even tell when an enemy has barely missed you by the way the gunshot sounds. A hiss means it's close. A snap means it's even closer. And this? is where the video originally ended. I talked a bit about those being the three things that FPS is needed to do to maintain flow, and then I sent you on your way. But something didn't feel right. I went back to Doom. I recalled someone on the internet calling it the most misunderstood game of all time. I think what the OP meant was that Doom wasn't about shooting. After all, calling the shooting mechanics simple would be an understatement. He was saying it was about movement. I agree with the first half. Doom isn't about shooting, but it really isn't about moving, either. It's about decision-making. If you look at the entire combat cycle, it always ends and starts with a choice. You choose to shoot. Feedback tells you whether or not you hit. You make another choice, to keep firing or change up. Eventually, the reload, the rate of fire, some other mechanic forces you into cover to retreat or strafe. 
the combat cycle ends. And when the combat cycle ends, there's just enough time for the player to create a mental model of the game. It's off this mental model that he makes a choice. It's ultimately these quick-fire decisions that keep us in flow and make FPSs so addictive. We have to present the player with clear, interesting decisions at the end of each combat cycle. So much of this comes down to two simple rules. A weapon can't be dominant in all situations. But a weapon has to be dominant in some situations. These two rules create roles. And roles are the key to interesting decisions. Interesting decisions have to matter, and decisions will only matter if each weapon is unique in the context of its own game. The choice between a shotgun and an assault rifle is far more interesting than the choice between a shotgun and a shotgun that does less damage. To make weapons truly unique, we need to make sure each one is differentiated by a set of variables that are statistically independent from one another. That they aren't just less and more powerful versions of the same gun. Make a weapon that's high damage, close range, and hit scan, or high damage, slow rate of fire and projectile, or medium range, fast rate of fire, and a slow velocity. Once we've created interesting choices, we need to make sure that those choices are made clear to the player. The first step is to avoid balancing weapons with theoretical weaknesses that might not be clear. Instead, use physical limitations. Physical limitations are tangible and easy to understand, like the number of bullets in a clip, the rate of fire, or the velocity of the bullet. Theoretical weaknesses are, by their nature, invisible to the player. They're hidden math. Maybe a weapon does slightly less damage per bullet, or its accuracy is a few percentages better or worse than another's. These theoretical characteristics will never be as clearly communicated to the player as physical ones. We want players to act with intentionality. For that to happen, we need each weapon's appearance to reflect its function, so that the players know how each one works before they even pick it up. If we make the gun small and slim, then we'll communicate that it's rapid fire with weak damage. But if it's big and bulky, then we'll say that it's slow but powerful. Pay attention to its animations, the way it reloads, the way you carry it, the way you equip it. Then there's the reticle. It might look like a sniper rifle's, small and focused, or a rocket launcher's, big and inaccurate. What about the gun's voice? Is it soft or is it loud? All of this is doubly important in multiplayer arenas, where your enemy's decisions inform your own decisions as much as any other discernible pattern in the game. David Serlin and Tucker Abbott popularized the term yomi to describe this sensation. Yomi being the Japanese word for reading the mind of your opponent. Making weapon-based decisions simple allows the sensation of yomi to happen more easily. As yomi happens more and more often, the perceived challenge of a multiplayer game evens out, competency motivation sets in, and the player can more easily enter flow. And that's it. In the end, it might seem simple. Rhythm, high perceived challenge and high perceived skill, clear feedback, and interesting decisions. Four things that can make any FPS great. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.